All right, I guess we'll just get started. Uh, so hi, I'm Rick Edgecomb. Um, just to introduce myself a bit, it's probably most of you don't know me. I work on kernel hardening at Intel. Uh, most of my career, I've worked on a pretty wide variety of user space stuff before more recently moving into kernel. And while I've got a bit of a security background, I'm much more of an engineer than an exploit developer. Uh, but today, uh, I'm excited to talk about the work I've been doing on running the kernel and executing only memory uh, because it's been a pretty interesting project. So execute only memory is, of course, memory that's not readable or writable, but is executable. And it's useful when stopping or for stopping the steps in attacks where the attacker needs to learn about the executable code. So it's a, it's a lesser known fact that some Intel CPUs actually support the ability to create execute only memory on VMs uh, going back many generations. So today I'm going to talk about, first of all, how, first of all, how this helps uh, security wise then how to, uh, how to enable uh, this for the kernel, and then lastly, uh, ongoing work to make the, uh, the feature safe to turn on and future rules that the kernel would have to follow in order to support running the kernel in this mode. Um, I have a fairly mature POC at this point, but it's, I haven't posted it to any of the lists, so it's still a work in progress. Um, I'm gonna have a link to some GitHub repos at the end for um, if anyone wants to take a look at the current status. Okay, so why use execute only memory? Um, the criteria is, is actually pretty simple. It's when your executable code or the location is secret. So if your execu executable code's known, public, um, and the location's known or can be found out easily, it really doesn't help you at all. Uh, so if with the kernel, it's often the case that the executable code is known, but um, you know, for distro kernels and things like that, but uh, for unpublished cloud kernels, that cannot be the case. Uh, so they might have patches or configs or compiler versions that the attacker wouldn't know about. So there's some code diversity there. But the main inspiration for this is the fine-grained KSLR that Christian Nicardi presented at this conference last year. And for anyone that's unfamiliar, it's kind of like live patching on steroids, where every function in the kernel is linked in a random order at boot time. So even if the boot image is known to an attacker, the kernel text wouldn't be. Um, so, so far, you know, the, just a short summary of where that's at. Um, it's been booted with several core subsystems randomized, um, but work is still going on it. And if anyone wants to get an update, there's a link at the bottom where she has a wiki where she maintains her status. And then lastly, uh, up in user space, the ASLR offsets are often considered secret, and that's what Android uses execute only memory for. Um, so uh, let's look at how this helps with uh, some real world attacks. Um, probably most are familiar with this general uh, format. Um, this CVE listed here is a use after free of a struct that has function pointers in it. So when that memory gets uh, triggered by the attacker to be reused, then the, um, the attacker can control where those function pointers uh, are pointing to in the old uh, usage of the allocation. Uh, so, of course, in order for the attacker to, to use this, um, they need to know, you know, if they want to use it for anything other than crashing the kernel, they need to know where to, uh, uh, to redirect control flow to. So, um, and then, of course, for ROP attacks, the attacker needs to know even more about the text because they need to know not just one location that's useful to them, but lots of little snippets all over the text that they can assemble uh, using a fake stack that can execute as it's... Um, as it's unwound. So this, of course, lets the attackers work around um, data execution pr uh, protection technologies. So uh, you know, even if they can't have a way to um, write or create executable map code, um, they can just use the little gadgets scattered all over the text to uh, create some new functionality and then sort of do something like executing arbitrary code. Um, so uh, now let's look at how this works in the case of a, a limited text leak. Um, you know, the, there's an attack called JITROP, which was originally done for user space against fine grain randomization. And here we've sort of mixed that with some common uh, kernel exploit steps to talk about how roughly this would work in the kernel. Um, so the scenario is the attacker has some arbitrary call primitive and some leaks of some small code. So maybe uh, a function pointer leaked or return address off the stack or something like that, enough for them to get some idea of at least part of the, uh, the text. 
so often this small region of Texas is not going to have enough gadgets to, cur to do like a full ROP attack. Um, but it may have, it's more likely that it may have some gadgets that could be used to form an arbitrary read primitive, in which case the attacker could just read the rest of the text and then get no enough gadgets to do, you know, a second stage of the attack, which is often uh, turning off the ability to call and uh, turning on the ability to call back in the user space or SMEP as it's called on x86. Um, so this is sort of the scenario that where execute only memory helps. Um, when the attacker has the ability to read the text, um, then they will be prevented from doing that. Um, you can see that it's kind of a last line of defense. You know, I ideally the attacker would be stopped earlier. Um, so like uh, fuzzing and sanitizers would help prevent the use after free, and forward edge CFI would help prevent the, uh, the arbitrary call from being able to really call any, any place arbitrarily. Um, and, but those are not completely foolproof, so uh, execute only memory can sort of be uh, a last line of defense where if they've already got those things that you don't want them to have, then at least they could be, uh, it can make them hard for them to use them. So the other factor here is uh, being able to know the text with absolute confidence. Uh, if the attacker can only guess where things are, you know, with some degree of certainty, um, it can help thwart attacks where an attacker has a foothold in his system. Uh, but they may be wary of crashing the kernel and being discovered, so they would, if there's some attack they can do that has a, a not 100% chance of success, they could be forced to look for other attacks. Which sort of leads to um, the next uh, point, which is what other ways there are to discover text. So uh, with KSLR, usually only a single text address leak is enough to uh, de-randomize the whole kernel text. And of course, execute only memory can't stop data leaks. It's about stopping reading the text. Um, so, uh, and of course, you know, attacks are always advancing. And there's been work on using uh, cache side channels for de-randomizing text. And then lastly, you know, the most straightforward deterministic way of reading text is using some sort of read exploit to read out the text. And this is the type of leak that execute only memory helps with. So. The point of this is that you know, execute only memory is not a lockbox. You can't put code in there and assume the attacker will never learn anything about it. Uh, what it is is it's another hardening feature that can lock uh, some techniques used by attackers. So you know, with those limitations called out, I want to explain why I'm actually still pretty excited about this feature. Um, you know, security is an increasing concern, and there's lots of proposals with different combinations of uh, effectiveness, performance, and complexity. Um, ideally, we want something like the green circle where it's very effective, it has low complexity and low performance impact, and that's like a, that's a win. And if there's something with, you know, on the opposite side with low effectiveness, high complexity, and high performance impact, then maybe it's not worth the trade-off. And usually, you know, the mitigations are somewhere in between. So the cool thing about execute only memory, it's not that it can stop all attacks, it's not like a big hammer, but um, uh, and it, it's targeting sort of the older but still valid class of executable code focused attacks. But the unusual thing is that it doesn't, as least as I've been able to measure so far, bring much of a performance hit. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna get into how this works, um, which is the part that is uh, maybe especially interesting. Uh, some people may be aware that x86 page tables don't have a way to set kernel memory as executable but not readable. So first I'm gonna explain um, how to enable hardware support, and then lastly, how, or then after that, to enable how, uh, uh, to enable the kernel to run in this mode. So some CPUs today support execute only memory. Recent Intel CPUs with protection keys, uh, you can set uh, user space memory to execute only. Um, some ARM CPUs have this uh, as well. And a piece of trivia I found when I was researching this is that the 286 had the ability to create execute only memory uh, segments. Uh, presumably they weren't concerned about JIT ROP when they designed that, but uh, <laughs> it, is, it is supported, so. Um, but anyway, the place where this is uh, relevant to what I'm gonna talk about today is in the extended page tables. Uh, so in case anyone's unfamiliar, hypervisors virtualize physical memory. So when there's a TLB miss in the guest, uh, first the guest physical address is looked up from the normal page tables. And then the host physical address is looked up from the extended page tables. And extended page tables is the Intel name for this technology. Um, you know, sometimes it's called second level page tables or two dimensional page tables. Uh, but in the Intel version, you can see in the permission bits here, I don't know if you guys can see on the mouse, I'll just point here. So you can see there's a, a read, 
a, a read bit that can be zeroed. Um, this is on some CPUs, so not everything that supports EPT has execute-only memory support. Um, but on at least, um, I found CPUs going back quite a while that do support it. Uh, so one way I looked at um, doing this was just to add a hypercall that could allow the, the guest to restrict physical memory, you know, sort of downgrade memory permissions to be execute-only. Um, and then the kernel could just call this hypercall on its text. So the problem with this is that the kernel is not used to managing fine-grained physical memory permissions. It's used to managing virtual memory permissions. And in a lot of cases, it relies on being able to map the same physical memory twice with different permissions. A couple examples would be text patching, where there's a read-only mapping and a read-write mapping. Uh, and then also, when you talk about user space, it gets even more complicated because you could have uh, multiple processes mapping the same physical memory with different permissions. Um, or, you know, there's also the direct mapping and also the user space mapping of the same memory with different permissions. So it really uh, just be, starts to become very complicated and in terms of the user space support. I'm not even sure if it's possible to, to support um, the way the APIs are designed using just uh, physical memory permissions. And the other reason is that some text in the kernel is uh, 4K pages like modules. So um, in order to go uh, mark those pages as execute only without marking um, random other adjacent physical memories execute only. Uh, we need to break the large pages in the EPT, which of course makes the EPT walks take longer and could impact performance. So that sort of was, I actually built this out to see how it would look and it, uh, there was a lot of, it looked pretty awkwardly wedged in there and then it also doesn't support user space very well. So, um, so now a uh, little bit of history uh, in the past, you know, all memory was executable and attackers could just jump to data that they wrote. Uh, and then there was various data execution prevention uh, bits added, like the NX bit and the AMD64. And you can see here, you know, most of the permission bits are down here. And then the NX bit is, is at the end next to the reserve region. So the ideal, what would fit best with how the kernel manages this memory is just to have an execute only memory uh, bit in the, in the guest page tables that it can set virtual memory to whatever permission it wants. And, you know, we have a, a physical address uh, permission bit, not a virtual memory permission bit. Uh, so what, what we can do is that, you know, usually physical memory is mapped once, uh, as it would be for, you know, in the EPT, as it would be for real physical memory. But aliasing is supported, so we can map it twice. And if we map, you know, the first uh, region of memory as read-write execute permissions or whatever, uh, is needed by the hypervisor. Sometimes it wants that to be read-only or things like that. And then the second uh, region of memory is the same uh, physical memory mapped with execute-only permissions. That makes the top uh, physical address bit now kind of be like an XO permission bit. So when we toggle it, uh, and the, you know, the PFN would be in the, in the virtual page tables, we have a bit in the page tables now that acts like an XO permission bit. Uh, so at this point, we have kind of a neat hack, but we can actually take it one step further and make this bit ba uh, backwards compatible with how the, uh, the SDM says that uh, x86 CPUs are supposed to behave, SDM being the Intel software manual. Um, so there's a CPU ID leaf that provides the number of physical address bits supported by a CPU. And uh, the, the number of the top physical address bit to bit 51 in the page tables is defined as a reserved area. And if a bit is set there, the CPU will often throw a page fault with the reserved error code bit set. Uh, but the SCM says that this can't be relied on, that it may happen, but in the future, these bits may be used for other things. So um, it follows all the rules for these bits to mean something else. So what we do is when, you know, this CPU ID uh, leaf here is what tells the physical address bits, and it's usually virtualized by hypervisors. So when the uh, guest uh, queries this leaf, we just tell the guest that it actually has one less, the CPU has one less physical address bit than it actually has, which changes the meaning of the, that bit to be not the, um, the, uh, the last physical address bit, but the first reserve bit. And so now we've moved this bit out of the physical address bit range into the reserve range, and we've sort of in software sort of created a new um, uh, uh, page table permission bit. So now um, it's just another, uh, you know, this is just like if, um, if, if a new CPU came out with a new permission bit and it's easy for the kernel to digest because it's used to uh, handling things like that. 
So it's just like a, another CPU feature at this point. Um, so uh, you know, I'm not going to have time to get into the VMM changes, but the short story is that this actually fit pretty well with how QMU and KVM define their interfaces. Uh, so there wasn't a lot of changes needed to implement this. Um, I hope that this is the same for other hypervisors because I wouldn't want this to be just a QMU and KVM feature. Uh, but I haven't looked at any of them, so um, hopefully it's the same. Okay, so before we get into using, uh, using this for the kernel, I just want to digress for a bit to talk about how this trick could be used for user space. So, you know, today, like I said, if the CPU has protection keys uh, and you mprotect with um, prod exec but not prot read um, and some other flag dependencies, then you can get execute only memory today. So the kernel is giving this to you. You don't need to use any protection keys instructions or anything like that. It just sort of happens transparently. Uh, and the same is on some ARM platforms. But um, the lack of uh, hardware out there, you know, can lower the ROI for developers to try to take advantage of executing only memory. Uh, so the nice thing about this EPT XO feature is that it's been around for a lot longer. And since most of the cloud's VMs, we could probably turn this on for a ton of uh, kernels for user space um, without the stuff I'm about to talk about, you know, relatively easily. Uh, so that can make it more the XO for user space more of an expected feature, and then you know maybe help everyone by making you know, more apps using this so more hardware can be taken advantage of. Um, and like I mentioned, Android uses this today, so um, it is getting some usage, but you know, maybe if we can make it more prevalent, we could make it more of a thing. Okay, so back to the kernel. Uh, there's a ton of little tweaks all over the place needed to turn this on, like um, detecting it at boot, adjusting the PFN mask, uh, adding information to dump page tables and little things like that. But the core of getting it turned on is as simple as adding a new permission bit, a page type permission bit, and then adding some set memory helpers because there's not any for setting XO memory. Um, I chose set memory readable and not readable because I thought it was more uh, generic. Uh, and you know, like, like on x86, like the read-only memory, this is gonna propagate automatically to direct map the, the not readable permission. And so then we just set it on kernel and module text. Um, as far as when this is set, uh, it's um, whenever the kernel text would be read only. So if the text is read write and being loaded, you know, we don't set it as execute only. Um, and then uh, for patching, um, you know, at a really high level, uh, this sort of seems to happen in two ways. Either an existing mapping that was read only is set to read write temporarily and the patching happens on the existing mapping or a completely new mapping is created that's read write and the, uh, the, the patching happens through that mapping and the original mapping is left alone. So in either case, whenever the mapping is read write, it's not set execute only. So uh, now we just change the rules underneath the kernel uh, as they've been since the beginning of time and sort of set it on the kernel text and turn it on to see what would happen. And what broke was actually uh, it mostly just works, surprisingly. Um, the main breakage was with text patching features. Um, the writable mappings get the correct permissions like I just talked about, but a lot of the patching needs to decode instructions and things like that. So, um, uh, and then some of them also need to verify that the patching was correct with the bug on checks. So uh, those, those reads of the kernel text broke, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how we fix that, because like I said, we don't want to lose the text patching features. Uh, one interesting thing that came up was that the kernel's read-only data is actually immediately appended to the execu executable data, and so the last page of the executable data, um, you know, is, or the first page of the read-only data is set executable. Uh, so then when you set all the kernel text as execute-only, it means the first part of the read-only data is not readable, uh, which is obviously a problem. Uh, so the solution there is just to page align the read-only data when you're doing execute-only text. Um, and then hibernate breaks since it expects to be able to read pages in the direct map, which are now not readable. Um, it already checks that the page is present and assumes that means it's readable. So this is easy to fix. We just got to check the, the not readable permission as well. Um, but since this is targeting VMs in the current patches I have, I've just sort of disabled it when you're doing execute only. Um, I think this is probably be fixed, uh, but the current status is that it's just disabled. Um, the part of the oops message that prints the, the place where the fault happened uh, this fails gracefully with probe kernel read failure, um, but the rest of the message, including the stack trace, works just fine. And then lastly, um, data embedded by the tool chain, uh, which was, you know, jump tables and literal pools and those kind of compiler optimizations. 
which was my biggest concern getting into this. It actually turned out to be, not be a problem, and I'll get into a bit uh, why that was the case. So the text patching features, uh, you know, like I said, you know, they, re they read the read-only mapping to decode instructions and things like that. Um, so there were sort of two solutions to this. One was to just to set the text in place readable whenever this is happening. And the other would be to do something like a text poke for reads. Uh, recently, text poke on x86 got changed to be a single CPU mapping, which means that uh, no one else, uh, no, no other CPUs can go in and use that writable mapping while it's being written to. So like if there's any write bugs or something like that, they can't be used to go um, write to this mapping and overwrite the kernel text. Uh, so we wanted to have something like that for reads where um, you would be able to go read the kernel text without uh, allowing any other CPUs to read it. Uh, so for now, the simple solution, I went with the simple solution, which is just to mark the, the text in place readable. Uh, but there's two things to point out about this, is that none of the cases where this was needed to be done were triggerable for, from just an unprivileged user. Because if the unprivileged user can trigger the text being set readable, it really reduces the benefit of this, since the attacker will just turn it off when they don't want it to be there. Um, and then jump labels, which are triggerable by an unprivileged user, uh, reading text was not strictly required in that case. So I sort of got away for now with not creating this tech, text poke for reads, but if there's any cases that I missed, or if there's any uh, ones that are planned, then I'd have to go back and make something like the text poke for reads uh, in order to make this work. So for now, we've gone with the easy solution, but there's a plan in case something comes up. Okay, so I found this part really interesting. Uh, it turns out that GCC has not embedded data in executable code for a long time, or at least on x86. And there, I guess there's two reasons for this. One is just some sort of least privilege reasoning that, uh, you know, sometimes gadgets are rare that attacker might need for a particular attack like stack pivots, um, and that we don't want to mark any more data as executable than we need because there might be useful gadgets in there. Uh, but the other reason was for, that it was thought, at least there's a school of thought that is better for performance. Because there's separate caches for data and instructions in some cases, like the TLB, like if you have a, an ITLB and a DTLB, and you have data and executable code in the same page, then you get two entries where you really only needed one, and it increases TLB pressure. You know, the L1 cache is also split, and so there's some similar complications there, but in any case, the GCC people I talked to said that the compiler, on x86, the compiler embedding data in executable code should be considered a bug. So this was really fortunate um, that this, for other random reasons, was just like it was needed for execute only, uh, and that's why when I turned this on, it just booted. I kind of didn't believe it at first. I thought I must have uh, made a mistake, but, um, that it just sort of works, so that was really lucky. Okay, so performance. Um, the core of this is a hardware permission bit, so I wasn't expecting a big hit, uh, but potential areas that could still cause an issue uh, are extra cache pressure from the mid-level EPT page tables, since we're duplicating the physical addresses, uh, uh, extra mid-level translation cache pressure for a similar reason, and then also some extra memory usage for the extra EPT pages. Um, now, these are faulted in, so they're not created until they're needed, but um, uh, so in testing so far, uh, I haven't observed a slowdown. You can see in this benchmark, execute only actually came out a little bit faster. I don't think that's the case. I think this is just noise. Um, so I was sort of expecting to see some slowdown here, and I'm, so I'm going to keep looking for it, but so far I haven't observed any. Um, Okay, so uh, we've just created a magical new security rule, and our analysis is that it should work fine, um, but you know, we don't want to rest on that. Uh, a couple things to still worry about are assembly that embeds data in text, because like I said, the compiler won't do this, but in assembly, you can still do it. Uh, C code that reads text for unknown reasons, and then maybe even some lurking bugs that read text on accident, but currently with no consequence, and so we don't want to turn those inconsequential bugs into crashes. Um, some static analysis was done on the kernel text to see if there were any places that at least the kernel statically read itself and none were found. But you know, this still can't rule out that this might be happening in some way. So the idea is to provide two enforcement options. Uh, one, where the kernel oopses like it does for any other uh, memory permission violation. And another, where it just fixes the permission, the, the readable bit, uh, or the exo permissions. It logs where it happened with a, a you know, stack trace and a warning saying, you know, exploit attempt detected, like it does for NX bit violations. And then it just continues executing. Uh, so in this case, the risk of turning this on is just extra log noise. 
and it gives a, uh, us a way to flush out any issues where this you know, might have uh, run across flight cases that I missed. And then you know, slowly the idea is this non-strict mode could maybe be a temporary thing and this would move towards strict mode. Um, uh, so, uh, so before I talk about how that can work, I have to talk about what happens when there's XO violation. You know, these XO faults are triggered as actually by the hardware as EPT violations because they're, they're physical memory permission violations. And what I have is KVM will see that it's an XO permission violation and inject a fault into the guest that it can handle. Now, on, at least on Intel CPUs, the existing XO faults are from protection keys, which have their own error code. These are the error codes here. Um, but the existing bits, uh, so that, that error code doesn't really correspond to what we're doing here with this made up permission bit. So the, uh, the existing bits, though, at least semantically, uh, have a way to describe what sounds like an XO permission violation. The key bits being the page was present. Uh, it was a read violation, but it was not an instruction fetch. So th that's, what I've, that's what I'm doing right now is when there's a EPT violation, I inject a fault like that. Um, but there's actually another option, uh, which is this thing called VE, uh, which stands for virtualization exception. So with VE, it's a, it, this is an Intel feature that's not implemented in the kernel today. Um, there's a separate, completely separate interrupt vector that can be configured to receive EPT violations directly to the guest. And it was imagined for usages like this where there's some way for the guest to actually fix its own EPT violations. The downside of using this, so it's, it seems like it should be a really great fit, but the downside is that there's CPUs that support execute only memory, but not VE. And so for those CPUs, KVM would have to emulate VE, and so it starts to become more, you know, not less complicated, but more complicated. Uh, and since we want to support a bunch of old CPUs with this, um, you know, I've went with the simplest method right now, which is just injecting the faults, but um, we'll see what people think on that. Okay, so implementing non-strict mode. And, you know, uh, I talked earlier about how the, um, we, 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 don't, we don't want to have security solutions. If they have too much complexity, that's not good. And this is where there's a little bit of complexity that creeps in. Um, I'm hoping the non-strict mode would be a temporary thing. Uh, I think you know, it's possible that all this work to sort of detect these uh, XO violations that were missed maybe will never be executed. That maybe somehow, uh, you know, most, uh, the kernel was way more um, accepting the XO permissions than I expected. Uh, so maybe this, this stuff is completely unneeded, but um, some potential solutions for this are, uh, you know, a hypercall like the one I first discussed that can turn off XO permissions on the uh, physical address range of the XO. Uh, and the problems with this is that it sort of muddies the virtual memory abstraction and creates uh, non-deterministic behavior when the pages are reused. So if um, this page got, you know, say you were a user space program and the kernel had an XO violation, now that page is no longer uh, actually XO and that page gets assigned to user space and you were relying on that and it doesn't work anymore. Uh, that's not ideal. Um, you know, could disable execute only for the whole system, uh, which has a similar problem for user space, and it's kind of just a little bit uh, extreme. And then lastly, uh, to try to t fix the XO permission in the guest page tables, uh, which sort of keeps the nice virtual memory abstraction and, the, and how we're pretending this is a, sort of a real hardware feature. Uh, but the problem with this is that the XO faults can happen in any context. Uh, and so it could race, we're trying to, trying to fix some of the page tables, we can't lock. And so uh, then, you know, this could race with other page table changes and create all sorts of weird behavior. Um, another complication with all these is that if you probe the fault handler, then you could be redirected into a BPF program or something that calls into the kernel and hits another XO fault. Um, so uh, that one I, is still sort of open. Um, Right now, I've sort of just disabled probing when you're using the fault fixer on the, on the fault handler. Not all probing, just on the fault handler. But um, I still need to look into maybe some better ways of doing that. But on the, the races, though, I think, I hesitantly say I think that this can be done. Um, so like I said, the XO faults can happen in interrupts, so we can't lock. Uh, and so we need to locklessly change the page tables in the fault handler. Um, this is a little bit easier than it sounds because the XO faults can only happen on XO pages, and those pages only are created in a few cases, like in a limited case a set of cases. So we can avoid races uh, here by forbidding any um, uh, change of the, the page table permissions on those pages 
except for toggling the readable bit uh, whenever the page might be loaded. So if it's in use, like it's a module that's in use, then, um, then we can't change the permissions on it. Uh, and then the other case is that breaking of large pages, uh, which could happen on the kernel text direct map, um, these page breaking could be overwritten by the fault fixer. So uh, we can't break any large pages when the pages are not readable. Um, so uh, you know the main issue here are, it was ftrace, which sets all the modules to be read, write, and execute while it's patching. Uh, so if you're doing ftrace, and then live patches uses this method. So if you're doing live patching or ftrace, then right when the exo fault fixer goes off, then there could be issues. So the way I worked around this uh, for now is using text poke in ftrace, and this was actually proposed earlier because um, the ftrace mapping all, the, leaving all the modules that read, write, and execute uh, le exposes those, uh, that mapping for other CPUs that maybe may have dangling pointers in there, and so they go, be able to go overwrite the text. So it's kind of better for security uh, in other ways, but the, uh, the, 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 down, the reason why this wasn't merged was because uh, it, it takes a little bit longer to go uh, install the trace points using this way. So this is an install time uh, uh, slowdown. So, uh, but here we have no other choice. So ftrace is when you, only when using the fault fixer. So not when you're using execute only strict mode, but only the non-strict mode. We go and use textbook in that case. Um, so uh, I built a solution around this and it seems promising, but I'm not ready to say that it's solved yet. Um, but I'm still kind of going down this path. Um, so this is the part that's the call to action. You know, if we want the kernel having execute only text to have a future, we need to have a new assumption that the kernel text is not always readable. Um, if you have XO or non XO architecture specific code that reads text, um, then uh, so then uh, you know this is okay. If you have a module that needs to read itself for some weird reason. Um, this is okay. There's a module parameter to mark the module as not XO compatible. And then if you have, but if you have core code uh, that unconditionally reads text in the core kernel, you know, in C or something, um, then this would no longer be okay. You'd have to go check if you're using XO text or, you know, we could create like the text book for reads that just does a mem copy or mem compare if you're not using XO. Um, but this would have to be sort of, there'd be a little bit more care needs to be taken with that. Uh, and then if you have like x86 code that uh, reads the text like all the text patching stuff I found, then you'd have to use more care. So if we want this to be a thing, you know, then we have to sort of agree that going forward, that we'd have to go take more care in these cases. Um, so my plans for this would be to first try to land user space support um, in the, you know, this, which would mostly be VMM enabling. Uh, and then in the, uh, the guest kernel itself, it would be you know, pretty similar to just adding uh, other permission bits, which is sort of a well-worn path. And then after that, that sort of infrastructure was landed, I tried to land the, the XO feature for kernel. And then, you know, everyone would be reading, uh, using non-strict mode at the beginning and sort of watch and wait, to see if anything was found and try to work around or fix any issues that are found. Uh, and then, uh, then there's also some options for strengthening this. You know, there's the simple tables, which would be a pretty interesting target if you're trying to figure out where the, the functions are located in the kernel. So we'd want to leave these unmapped potentially or dropped after boot, um, which would limit some functionality. Uh, and so that this could also be uh, sort of strengthening the, this feature. You know, this wouldn't be the start of, a, of, a, of a, something to plug all leaks. We, you know, that would sort of be a, a never ending task. You know, this is supposed to be just a hardening feature that blocks some ways of figuring this out. So, uh, but the symbol tables seem like a big sort of thing that could be gone after. And then also maybe turning on execute only for BPF JITs. I haven't looked at this at all. It may be just as simple as turning it on. Um, but uh, that could also be uh, useful. If you leave any of the text as readable, then that's where the attacker would probably start going to read and look for the gadgets they need. Um, so my favorite way to characterize this feature is that it's kind of like the NX bit. You know, the NX stopped easy ways of getting arbitrary code execution for free in hardware. Um, you know, there's, o there's other ways like ROP where the attackers can still do arbitrary code execution, but the value of NX is that um, the performance security trade-off is there. 
and it stops a whole bunch of low level attack, low effort attacks. So execute only memory um, is available now in existing hardware and hopefully, you know, I'm gonna keep looking, hopefully free uh, or close to free performance wise. Uh, but if we wanna support this long term, the cost is mostly in the complexity of now, especially text patching stuff, has to take more care when reading the kernel text. Um, so, and if anyone wants to look at the patches, like I said, I haven't posted the list yet because it's not ready. Some of these commits don't have commit messages and things like that, but if anyone wants to take an early look, uh, I push, put them up here on GitHub. Uh, so that's, that's it. Um, if there's any questions? Did you find any examples of modules that read themselves for weird reasons? Uh, I did not, and I haven't uh, looked yet, but I thought, I did find one case. Uh, well, actually, it was pointed out to me by a GCC person I talked to where there was a, a library with, with assembly code that did read itself. So I thought if anyone's using assembly language libraries or something in a module that there may be stuff like that. So I, I didn't find any in the modules, but I haven't looked that hard at that. Um, but I have found it in, I, like I know of a case in user space, so. And what about literals in assembler? Uh, what's that? Literals. Uh, well, you said they could exist, but did you uh, uh, look at all at the x86 assembly? Uh, well, I mean, I, I didn't, so we, there was uh, somebody that had done some work on execute-only memory for user space um, at Intel, had built some static analysis tools for analyzing user space programs, and they had adapted those to look at the, the kernel text, and those tools, of which I don't know the details, uh, didn't find anything. So the static case, uh, it seemed like there wasn't. And then also, it boots with execute-only, well, so I set execute-only memory during boot, so if the, if the if the assembly is happening really early, it's not execute only. Um, so then that should be fine because I just want to turn this on before user space comes up. Um, yeah. So for user space, mm -hmm. uh, have you found any application that uh, assumes that protexec implies prot, prot read? Uh, so yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so I, uh, I haven't done the user space, first of all, I haven't done the user space uh, uh, patches for this feature yet, but that's how um, Protection Keys does it. So it said in the commit message that they did, a, uh, they looked for user space programs that did that, that just did prod exec because it should work, uh, thinking, oh, I'll just put one flag, and they didn't. Oh, uh, you haven't found any on R64? Is that what you said? Yeah, no, no, I'm from blank of user space. Okay. No, no, uh, so I haven't looked at all, but uh, all I saw is that for pre protection keys, they looked and didn't see any. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of thought that was kind of a brave choice to make, but um, apparently it works out. Um, how does this affect things like crash dumps and stuff? Does, or do you typically from KVM do that from the host side? Uh, you mean like an oops or something else? Right, what is like a crash dump oops because it's yeah. trying to read the text to write it out to the dump? Yeah, so, it, so since we're injecting a fault, it actually works with the probe kernel read uh, uh, function, so this will just return, you know, fail, it wasn't able to read the text. So the oops, the oops uh, handler will try to read the text and find out that it's, it, it'll, you know, it acts like it would be if the page was not present, and it just says couldn't read the text. Right. And, yeah. and then the, the uh, stack trace works fine because that's off the symbol tables. Yes, but what about like the KDUM patches and other stuff where you have like kexec to another Kernel that's then going to write the the crash the panic the crash uh, number. I'm out. not sure. Okay. Uh, any other questions? All right. Let's thank the speaker. Yeah.